Thanks very much for uh, inviting me. I am very uh, thoroughly aware that I'm one of the more junior members in this crowd, and uh, I have learned more for, uh, from the other presentations than, I don't know, perhaps you will learn from this one, but uh, I'll try my best. Um, so uh, the, topic, the title here is, to con is Connecting Tamangic and, uh, with Written Tibetan. Uh, verbs and beyond, and the idea is that uh, I'm going to look. I'm going to be looking at this group of languages called Tamangic, or as I will call them, TGTM. Uh, and they're a small, uh, somewhat small um, group of languages spoken in central Nepal um, that are hypothetically um, a member of Bodish. And Bodish is, is a term that floats around in literature from very early on, um, and it's sort of hypothetically a group, um, but requires uh, rigor sort of rigorous verification uh, through new grammarian means, uh, i.e. sound changes. So this group um, of languages called Bodish us is usually considered to include uh, Tibetic, so all the Tibetan dialects, dialects, languages that um, uh, descend from Old Tibetan, of which we have uh, written documents. Uh, East Bodish languages, which are spoken in Bhutan, uh, mostly Bhutan, Arunachal Pradesh, um, and West Bodish. And West Bodish is often uh, a term used um, to include mainly the TGTM languages. So TGTM uh, is an acronym from uh, the, t the four major uh, modern languages from which the reconstruction was done, Tamang, Gurong, Takari, and Manange. And this is sort of the, uh, the term I will use for uh, this group. So uh, this tree is a sort of a good, uh, sort of impression of what people have been saying. Um, basically, uh, uh, Tibetan, the, Tibet, the Tibetan uh, languages, East Bodish, and they're, some, they're a bit more closer together, and then the impression is that West Bodish is slightly farther away. Um, so this is, what I'm, this is part of what I'm going to take up today. Um, I'm going to try to uh, look at this classification through sound changes. Um, so what we have now is a reconstruction uh, in containing about a thousand words by uh, Mazodon. Um, and let me just show you sort of a, a, a quick, quick and easy sort of comparison um, of the kind of questions that uh, we're facing when we, co when we look at comparing, comparing TGTM forms uh, with written Tibetan forms. So uh, tone is pretty much the sort of only huge outlying issue. And this is, not, this is something I won't cover today. I have some ideas as to how to correlate um, the proto A B tone uh, as reconstructed by Mazodon with Tibetan, but it's more it's it's a lot more complicated. But apart from that, we see that uh, uh, written Tibetan has a set of uh, prefixes, or uh, and so some of these prefixes are uh, pre-initials, so they're part of the stem, they're root, uh, they're part of the root, they're just um, sesquisyllabic in. Uh, uh, in phonological status. Um, others are true prefixes, and those come in some um, nominal functions, but also most, uh, most prominently in verbs, um, in verbal paradigms, we'll see later. Um, the medials and the rhymes are mostly unproblematic, so the only thing that's worth noting is that TGTM has uh, a set of diphthongs, uh, yodicized diphthongs, um, and I've and there's pretty good evidence that they come from yodicization of a uh, of a coronal um, uh, of coronal of coronal finals. So it's pretty that, so that's pretty good there. Um, so so what I'm going to do um, today is twofold. I'm going to I'm going to talk about two studies I've done on the verbal system through correspondences between uh, verbs in these, uh, across these two language groups, and um, I'm also going to look at um, more generally how, uh, where, does, um, uh, where does TGTM sit um, in terms of this classific uh, classific classificatory relationship among Bodish. So on the verbal side, um, just as, a, back just as sort of a piece of background, background information, um, written Tibetan has a set of full-fledged paradigmatic morphology, and this is sort of very, very well known. Um, across Tibeto, uh, Tibeto Burman, so it's comes, it comes in this four uh, main four uh, four stem paradigm, often called present, past, or perfective, 
future imperative. Now, the, the real semantic value of these things are probably something closer, quite a bit closer to stated, pro stated progressive, perfective, irrealis, and imperative. Um, I'm not going to I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try to argue for those terms, but I'll use the traditional, so present, past, future, imperative to refer to these stems. Um, compare that, though, with uh, tamonic verbs. So tamonic verbs are, tamonic verb roots do not um, have this sort of paradigmatic uh, morphology. Um, they're, for the, for the greatest most part, um, invariable and the, uh, agglutinative, the agglutinative, agglutinative morphology that we see in modern TTM languages are uh, very clearly of secondary origin. So just to give you an example, this, this would be something that you would see. This is the maximal, actually, verbal complex in, that you see in Siklis Gurung is a variety of Gurung I've done research on, I've done field work on. Um, you get uh, all of these coming from uh, essentially uh, verbs, so B, uh, is an erstwhile verb to give, uh, y is to throw, uh, well, was to throw, um, negation, and hence. So, um, sort of gives us a, a trouble of how much uh, Tibetan verbal morphology there is in Proto Bodish, um, given this uh, modern status. So, okay, outline of today's talk. I'm going to talk about two case studies in Bodish verbal, uh, more verbal morphological reconstruction. One of them, in one of them, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to show that paradigmatic morph, uh, these paradigmatic morphemes that we see in written Tibetan existed in non-paradigmatic forms in proto bodish despite significant subsequent phonological erosion in Tamanic, um, so such that we only see remnants of it. But the functions, as we can uh, as far as we can see them, seem to uh, seem to correlate with um, written Tibetan. Now the second study. Um, is one where I sh I'll, I'll look at uh, a case of uh, a case of lexicalization of event structure um, that leads to a subsequent um, valency change, and this is, and the crucial evidence for that is actually lexical sem uh, a shift in lexical semantics. Um, I'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, now the third part um, I'll abstract away from the verbal system and, s and talk about um, sound uh, sound changes and how. We can use sound changes to determine the genetic um, status of TGTM. Okay, so let's jump into the verbal part. So two studies. Uh, I mentioned two studies. Uh, I'll start with the first one. So the, in the first one, and the first one is really sort of the beginning of, of this entire project. And this is to start to look for um, written Tibetan-like verbal morphology in TGTM. Now we have verbal. So the conclusions are that. Verbal prefixes B, G, and M are retained in a good number of TGTM forms with medial liquids. So, uh, written Tibet, so written Tibetan and other comparanda show uh, hist a historical reanalysis where uh, you start off with a prefix and a root which has a li which has liquids on the onset, um, often as pre uh, often as pre initials, and they are reanalyzed. Re respectively as the root initial and the root, me root medial. And sometimes this uh, sort of, co this sort of uh, uh, process preempts other onset consonants, and sometimes even the onset, the major onset, um, uh, major onset syllable. So an example, of a, uh, a caricaturizing example would be um, when you have br, b plus rlak in Kurobodish, in Kiddish TGTM, you get br reanalyzed as the onset and the medial, um, preempting the L, and then you get bra in, t in, in reconstructed proto uh, TGTM. Now in Tibetan, you get something like you get a uh, a paradigm with the verb rulak that shows um, paradigmatic forms as you expect them. Um, so, what's the data? So let's look at the data. Um, I find three forms um, in all of the words, in all of the TGTM words containing a cluster of BR, um, and that's uh, quite significant because there are only about 10 of them that are, uh, that are verbs, uh, and of which six of them are verbs that cannot be traced to root verbs in written Tibetan that have themselves a BR onset. Um, now, 
so the first one, uh, to walk, uh, teach him is bra. Written Tibetan has uh, a gro. Uh, so this is to go. Interestingly, the, there's no uh, past stem, uh, there's no regular past stem uh, attested for written Tibetan. It's suppleted by a different verb, which we'll actually talk about um, later on. Um, but the, uh, yeah, but the, cor the correspondence would be that this past stem uh, with a B, or with a B prefix, uh, present presents us with the best um, sound correspondences to bra. Um, similarly, you have bra to grind. So this is the, um, the, pr the prototypical example. In TGTM to grind large amounts of grain, in written Tibetan, uh, you get a, uh, you get a verb that has a more abstract, uh, more abstract meaning to uh, annihilate, uh, to reduce to dust in that sense. Um, and here you see, a, you see a clearer case of um, B prefixation being reanalyzed and preempting the initial. Uh, so there's also the word to write. Um, now this has been argued by uh, Nathan, uh, even, in, as, even in written Tibetan to involve um, a case of uh, reanal reanalysis of the B prefix. Um, in the past, in a, uh, in a past stem um, as the uh, root initial, um, is this word because you know by virtue of its meaning to write uh, is likely a Tibetan borrowing into Tamangic. Um, TGTM and TGTM languages in Tibetan have been in in contact with each other mostly through religion and through trade. Um, so it's not surprising we see um, technological and uh, religious terms being borrowed. Um, but the idea, but the idea st stands nevertheless that uh, in written, uh, that there is in fact an entirely analogous reanalysis that happened in uh, in old Tibetan between old Tibetan and uh, written Tibetan as well. Okay, so with uh, blah and mla clusters, clusters involving uh, an L medial, uh, we have to forget. Uh, we have mlet in uh, TGTM. In written Tibetan, you, uh, you, have, the, you have the same word, uh, meaning, word meaning the same, uh, same have the, having the same meaning, project, which is reconstructed to uh, mruled. Uh, so this is actually a perfect, um, uh, a perfect um, cognate. Um, here's an interesting one, uh, blo mlo, to prick. Uh, I haven't found any uh, Tibetan, uh, sorry, uh, Bodish internal correspondence to this. Maybe you can, you can, you can maybe you know some. But I found it in Himalayish languages, uh, in Limbu, in Bantawa, in Tulong. <coughs> Interestingly, there you have the root is basically the root starts with the uh, the liquid. Um, now, what we have to say is that if the root, verb root in uh, TGTM is really truly borrowed, um, then this form would have would be evidence that the B derivation was in fact once productive. Um, another form, um, bling, to push while rolling. Um, for an animate, per, uh, animate uh, object to fall down. Um, this one is interesting because uh, we have uh, written Tibetan cognates that are basically adjectival. And they mean, in a basic sense, basically something that is round and full in the round sense. Um, the words lingbo and bingspo um, uh, have, bas have both come to mean all, the entire, but in, the, in a very round sense, um, you could say the, an entire, uh, you could say an entire pancake, uh, as one of, one of the dictionaries tell us what these things mean. So it's very clear that there is a, a, an association with an earlier meaning of roundedness, and uh, round and spherical. Um, so the B derivation, the B verbal derivation, in fact, derives um, a causative verb. So either to make round or to uh, do emotions such as to make things round. Um, lastly, um, in Risiyang Kutamang, so this is one of the languages, we have a, uh, we have a, a pair of forms, pluk and klup. Um, so these are reconstructed to exactly the same forms in proto-TGTM, pluk and klup. This means to overturn or spill, to turn upside down. Now in, in written Tibetan, you have uh, the word, uh, you, have, you have the form to pour out, pour into, whose uh, past stem shows glutes. And in fact, this L, um, uh, in fact, this, this L um, 
interestingly is uh, aspirating the uh, B prefix that we see in Tamangic. Um, now, what's also interesting in Tamangic is that you have this initial final metathesis of a velar and a labial. And this is actually, it's, it's strange, but it's actually attested elsewhere in TGTM. So uh, when you have plec, or, or you have basically a word plec to press down to flatten dough with stick, um, in written Tibetan you have, in fact, gleb. And this gleb word um, is itself a, verb, uh, a denominal form um, involving the verbal prefix ke from the uh, uh, adjectival stem to uh, adjectival stem leb flat. So you have gleb uh, in written Tibetan um, co being cognate with, uh, with tamang uh, gleb, which then became uh, metathesized to plek. Um, so these are pretty good cognates for um, the pre for the presence of prefix b in, t in, in TGTM. How about prefix g? Uh, we find also very good evidence. So um, TGTM kla, um, to throw away, discard, abandon, divorce, renounce. This is a, uh, so the cognate for that in written Tibetan is in fact a, uh, an, an intransitive verb kla to be left behind, to remain. Now, uh, this is also, as we saw before, a, and if, uh, shows, it shows the, effect, the semantic effect of derivation by the G prefix, which is transitivizing. Um, Glue to buy. Um, in written Tibetan, you have this paradigm blue, blues, blue, blues, to buy off ransom. You also have this um, de uh, this deverbal noun form, ransom, glud. Um, now, what's interesting here is that uh, glud involves what uh, Guillaume Jacques proposed as a G prefix that's separate from the verbal G prefix. Um, he thinks it's a uh, a denominal prefix. Um, there is independent evidence for it, um, but for this for this form, though, there are two possibilities um, for the TGTM form. Um, either I think the G in the TGTM form is a cognate with the verbal G prefix in written Tibetan, or it is an instance of a of the nomin of a nominalizing prefix G, um, as reflected in as also as G in the uh, in the written Tibetan deverbal noun. If it's the latter, though, so if we say that this verb is in fact cognate with this um, noun, then we would have to—I would have to say that in uh, TGTM there's an independent uh, verbalizing morpheme that uh, has since been lost in form that derives that noun into a verb again. I don't—I'm uh, inclined not to take that because I think what's happening in written Tibetan here is that you have a paradigm that. Uh, has been leveled from uh, a B prefix form, as we see, as we've seen before. Uh, Tibetan does that sometimes. Um, so the the older pre-Tibetan um, paradigm would have been something like glue loose, uh, glue loose, uh, glue loose, uh, loose, or something like that, or loose. Um, and written to, uh, and TGTM inherits the G prefix form there. Um, but the other possibility is also uh, logically possible, but it will be less parkour. So summary of this part, there's good evidence for the existence of verbal prefixes B, G, and M in TGTM, uh, in TGTM uh, as they, in, the same sen in the same forms as they are attested in written Tibetan <coughs> paradigms. Both B and G are transitivizers. They transitivize statives and uh, statives adjectives. Um, so we've seen that. Um, G may be a, a nominalizing suffix, a reflex of G, but the evidence is not quite conclusive. Um, M and uh, M is associated with, in, indeed with an inner directed state, uh, state action that has been proposed um, for the prefix M, um, not, just for, not just in written Tibetan, but for uh, cognates in other Tibetan Burman languages as well. And for M, we saw, uh, the word we saw was to forget. Um, that's sort of a, a mental, uh, a mental state or a mental uh, change of state. So semantically also we see a pretty clear co uh, correlation between these forms. Um, so good, um, so we've established that um, there's pretty significant similarities between uh, what we see as paradigms in written Tibetan verbs and in uh, TGTM as just verb roots. Um, now how can TGTM verbs in their 
extremely pockal form, in, in, uh, possibly inform the study of written, uh, written Tibetan uh, puzzles um, in verbs, in verbal paradigms. Now, I think there has been an interesting um, thing that I've been uh, that, that that I found in TGTM that actually can give us that information, um, and this is a a process that I am ter uh, that I term secondary intransitivization. I think this is something that can shed light on a uh, somewhat well-known uh, puzzle in uh, written Tibetan verbal paradigms, namely a set of paradigms uh, that involve voicing alternations in the uh, root onset. So I'll present, I'll, t uh, I'll sort of give you a sense of what the, uh, what the puzzle is. So written Tibetan transitive paradigms, some of them, a small set of them, show an interesting voicing alternation in the root initial. Um, the past, uh, so we're, we're talking about this set, transitive, uh, the set I'm calling transitive B. So in the past and in the uh, imperative stem, you have a, uh, you have the voiceless variant of the onset. Notice that uh, aspiration in, uh, in Tibetan is already subphonemic, so aspiration here doesn't really show any uh, real underlying difference. But in the present, in the present and the future stem, you have, a, uh, you have the voiced variant of the onset. So the zu in the future stem here is, a, uh, is by a different sound change that uh, fricativized z. So this really would have been, uh, this, this really shows an underlying root z, starting with z. Now, why is that? Um, there have been many things, uh, many, many things said um, and many proposals, but Let's see, what, uh, let's see what Tamai can tell us. Now, the other um, puzzle, which I think remains kind of unresolved, is these, this set of tr uh, voicing alternating transitives often appear in these triplets. And this is, uh, as Nathan pointed out, um, and instead of doublets, uh, so these triplets alternate in terms of transitivity as well. Now, it's, in, it's interesting, um, it's sort of bizarre in a way, because trans transitive Transitivity alternating uh, forms usually occur in doublets. You have, a you have an intransitive and a transitive. Now, why do you have uh, a triplet? So you have an intransitive A, transitive B, and intransitive C. Now, why do you have two intransitives? Um, it's strange. Uh, it requires some sort of explanation. Now, triplets may be incompletely attested. They might have subparadigmatic variation, etc. So an example would be, uh, so to fall, you have a, an intransitive A, with a voiced uh, onset ba, uh, transitive B with voice alternating onset to bring down to make fall. Uh, intransitive C is uh, uh, not attested according to, um, according to Hill 2014, but uh, in an earlier paper, um, uh, Gezaure actually said that um, the honorific to, to go to come actually is, a, uh, is in, an intransitive C form um, originally meaning to descend. Um, you could also have intransitive A unattested, transitive B, so to pour out, to make uh, sort of flow forth, um, intransitive C to flow forth. Now, two questions, right? So first, why are triplets instead of doublets? And second, <coughs> why do these C intransitives have a voiceless onset um, that we only see in uh, transitive uh, in, some, in a subset of transitive uh, paradigmatic forms. So I'm going to try to answer each question in turn. First question, why triplets instead of doublets? Now, here's an observation from Tamangik. Now, Tamangik also has, um, so here's an observation. The observation is that past stems of transitive B paradigms are prone to what I call secondary intransitivization. Um, this is something that we, I see transparently in TGTM. Um, so TGTM cognates of words like four and five turn out to be pairs of intransitives, um, alternating in terms of onset uh, aspiration. So you have an intransitive A, pup, to fall, as when tripped, um, an intransitive C, pup, which means to go or come down. Um, the example is, you know, I, I, I have come down. Um, same thing, pure, to gush, uh, to gush forth, come out of the ground of water in a, mo in a monsoon, pure, for water to boil. Okay, so 
two important points, right? And I think it's pretty clear just by eyeballing it. Um, the aspirate intransitive C forms are semantically narrower. They're more specific than the intrans intransitive A forms. Um, so the idea is that going and coming down is a particular subtype of a downward motion. It's done by a human being. Um, boiling is a particular type of um, subtype of gushing forth. So five minutes left. Okay, wow. Um, so boiling is a particular subtype of gushing, uh, gushing forth. Um, so the type of events denote, but denoted by intransitive C verbs are agent cause specified subsets of events denoted by intransitive A. So um, going and coming down involves, is de described, a, described a downward motion of a human agent. Boiling is a, cause, is a gushing force caused by a volitional action uh, of boiling by some agent. Um, so to, just by way of analogy, we can think of English passive participles reanalyzed reanalyze resultative adject adjectives. So the idea would be that in Tamangic you have the equivalent of a pair between to be full and to be filled. And the, media the mediating factor would be a transitive verb to fill. Now, so here's the proposal. TGTM intransitive C verbs are derived intransitives from their agentive transitive counterpart, which has been lost. Now, the let's look at the sort of hypothesized pathway, right? So first you start off with a general causative meaning. Um, so something like, you know, John caused water to gush forth. So the idea would be, it means John did such a thing as to cause the result of water gushing forth. You've got, uh, but in this set of languages, both Tibetan and uh, TGTM, you have a homomorphism of agentive ergative case with instrumental case, which marks passive agents. And they, you have a lot of ar argument dropping. So this is an environment for reanalysis of past stems and past stem, past stem only as resultatives because only past stem, only the perfective sense gets us to resultatives. Um, so you, get sent, you probably get lots of sentences like water caused to gush forth. The water was caused, caused to gush forth. By John, if overtly specified, or by someone, if unspecified. Now the crucial step here is that semantic narrowing happens um, on this particular um, causative stem, uh, this sort of transitive stem towards a resultative sense that subsumes the causal event. So instead of gushing, cause to gush forth, you have a particular, a more uh, narrower sense of, be, of causing to gush forth, literally, uh, namely to boil. Um, that semantic narrowing gets lexicalized. It creates a new lexical root, um, and it leads to, in, in the Tibetan case, to uh, paradigmatic morphology extension. Um, so this is a stage where you, can't, you simply cannot say water became boiled by John um, anymore. The predictions of uh, this analysis is that, um, because, uh, is that any aspirate uh, initial intransitive C verbs that are secondary intransitives which show agent or cause specified semantic narrowing compared to transitive counterparts, vary, uh, there will be var uh, variations since this is a lexical shift. Um, you would have cases where you have um, a fully aspirate um, paradigm that is not intransitive, that's still transitive. Um, and third, the particular direction of the narrowing should be idiosyncratic. So you would get, you know, it's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no inherent reason why gushing forth would, be, would become boil as opposed to another type of narrower, narrow sense of uh, making, causing to gush forth. And I'm going to skip the data, but this is, but all of these um, predictions are borne out both in TGTM and in Tibetan. Um, now, the second question is, whether, is why written Tibetan intransitive forms uh, show this interesting abla pattern, though, that you only see in transitive form in the present stem. So I, I've said that uh, this past stem is the one that gets reanalyzed as an intransitive. Now, why do you see ebb um, in that, that you only see in transitive stems? Um, I think this this is a difficult. This is a really difficult. In, uh, a really diff this is a really difficult case, but I think the idea would be that secondary intransitivization in written Tibetan must have occurred after the innovation of paradigms. So after the establishment of paradigmatic uh, relations between these forms, um, and in analogical extent in this analogical extension of this paradigm this paradigm into this new newly um, innovated tr intransitive both the present stem and the past stem entered into the calculation of a new form. So, uh, so, yeah, so the root would be something like the uh, transitive stem, 
uh, the present symbol transitive, and then the addition of, the, of, aspir of aspiration to the onset would be something like, uh, would give you something like the resultative meaning. So that would be the sort of process that, that roughly goes into this uh, analogical extension. Now, TGTM verbs don't show this. And this is because TGTM verbs do not form paradigmatic relations with uh, these um, forms that you see in written Tibetan present stems. Now, these verbs showing the same ablotic morphology, so real cognates of the present stems are in fact attested in, in TGTM, but they are lexically independent. Um, you, show, you see that there is a clearly stative meaning, but they, you don't see that they are attested together with any sort of um, Paradig in any sort of paradigmatic um, relationship with the, with the perfective or the irrealis forms. So, um, basically the, so basically the conclusion here would be that written, the written Tibetan voice alternating verbal paradigms are grammaticalized stative active resolutive lexical pairs. Um, and there's a, f a piece of further evidence um, in the uh, idiosyncratic secretion <coughs> of exactly this paradigm to go. And this form, um, uh, this form is in fact a secondary intransitive, secondarily intransitivized past stem of to remove. And this is actually still shown in its semantics because this suppleted past stem of to go only means removal go. So you can, you can only say I left and went to Lhasa with this past stem. You cannot say I, walk, I went on the road with this stem. Um, so here, I, so here's the, so the summary. Secondary and, tra secondary and transformation happened both in TGTM and in written Tibetan with the same uh, process to the same stem, except that uh, written Tibetan has this additional contamination from um, paradigmatic morphology in the extension, um, in, the, in the calculation of this new stem, in the innov innovation of this new stem. So I'm gonna skip uh, part three, obviously because I'm out of time, but. Basically, uh, in part three, I show through um, an, uh, an examination uh, against the sound changes that have been proposed uh, recently um, for Tibetan and East Bodish that TGTM languages precede um, the splitting off between uh, Tibetic and East Bodish. So in fact, it is, so in fact, the, the original impression is right that West Bodish TGTM is an earlier split off. Um, and I propose a uh, shared innovation exclusively among TGTM languages that uh, define them as a group um, in a full neo-grammarian sense. Um, and uh, with that, I'll close, but we can discuss any of this uh, thing that you're interested in. Thanks.